And I remember Tiny called me. And it was a decision he wanted to make. He wanted to, uh, someone made him a generous offer to sell his shop. Tiny said, Yo, Coles, um, they made me an offer. I said, so, yeah. And he says, Like four times what I would pay for it. I said, Okay. I said, You know what, Chief? I can't get in your financial business. But to me, this is yours. This is something that you dream to own. This is your black owned business that you wanted. I said, Like I said, I'm not getting in it, but they can't take this from you. I said, you're bigger than just whatever they offer you. You know what I mean? And at the time, I don't even know it was a fine out you think. But he said, you know what cool calls? Yes, he's called me. He said, I hear you. Welcome back to the Beauty for Ashes podcast. I'm your host, Destiny Ireland, and I want to welcome you to chapter four of the book of Matthew. I started this project with the goal to finish what my dad started, to tell his life story to the best of my abilities without his personal perspective. I had no idea where it would take me, and I had no idea how it would end. So I'm being honest when I say that as listeners, you've been on this journey with me. Together, we've learned about my father's childhood, where his love for hip hop blossomed and where he found the gift that would eventually make him a local celebrity and until his death, a living legend. We talked about the glory days where men and women would stand in line for hours for a chance at a one of a kind haircut from Tiny. Together, we listened to story after story about how he touched the lives of community and his family and friends. And it's been a true honor to relive those amazing moments in his life. But the truth is, with any living person, there are ups and downs, wins and losses. Remember his barbershop got broken into a couple of times. Mm. And, um, and I was afraid for him to go back in there. Yeah, you know? yeah. And then and he'd go right back, you know, the next day to keep going. When he first opened his barbershop, first he opened the one down at the bottom and he got all these dollar bills and they wrote, oh, yeah. you know, they wrote on it, good luck, um, you know, great success, you know, yeah. all kinds of stuff on dollar bills. And he would have those dollar bills on his mirror, all yeah. across his mirror or, you know, a wall that he didn't have to use the mirror. Mm -hmm. And he took those, um, those dollar bills and put them up in his new barbershop too. Mm -hmm. And people still always came there and still gave it to him, you know, yeah. they wanted it on that wall. Yeah. Well, when he got robbed, they stole all those. <laughs> That's <laughs> terrible. They stole all those dollar yeah. bills. And he was so upset about it. Right. He was like, sure. you know, he said, those dollar bills meant so much <laughs> to me, you know, and they stole all yeah. of them. Um, you know, and, um, but no, he kept going. He still went back to work. Yeah. He was not afraid. And, you know, I don't know what Cook Street looked like uh, in the beginning, but towards the end when he was getting a lot older and it was changing so much, it was like not feeling safe. Right. It was not a safe place to be, at least to me. And he still went there every day. He, he still left. went there every day. Yeah. I would say like he stood his ground he staying did. there no matter yeah. what. And that's what like, a true business owner, especially like a black one, especially in a place that is, you know, a more diverse place. Like we're not talking about a suburb. This is a city. Yeah. And the people that really care, they stay no matter what. There's people that run. Right. They're like, oh, it's not safe anymore. I got to right. go to a better part of he town. Stayed. He stayed there. To and the I very, think that very says end. something too. He stayed into the very end until his mom had to like, basically force him right out of there because, because he, he was so sick he was sick and yeah. he still wanted to 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 stay sick tiny was getting sick i've wrestled with this fact for a long time how do i tell his story without addressing the elephant in the room the ending of the story he died because he was getting sick if i've learned nothing else from my father i've at least learned that you just have to tell it like it is 
The illness that he suffered from was a symptom of long-term alcohol abuse. The blessing and the curse of this addiction is that it didn't kill him suddenly. He dealt with chronic pain and other health issues for at least 12 years before he passed away. And as much as I thank God for those 12 years where he got to see us get jobs, find partners, and birth his grandchildren, I always struggle with the memories of watching him decline slowly. He always kept it private, and he never discussed it with anyone. And this is why I've wrestled with sharing this part of the story. But I think by the end of his life, He would have liked to share the truth with someone if there was any chance of saving someone else from the same fate. For the remainder of this episode, you'll hear stories about how my dad continued to help and serve others despite getting sicker and sicker. But before we go on with the episode, I want to say to someone out there who's listening and is struggling with an addiction, you are not alone. You don't have to go through life suffering in silence. There are people who love you that will do literally anything to keep you safe and healthy. And if for some reason you can't think of one person on earth who feels that way about you, I can promise you that there is a father in heaven who believes you are worthy of a better life. The Bible says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So open the door for the Lord and he will do the rest. I'm not going to say the names, even though I know exactly what both parties of the guys, but uh, there was two guys in front of dad's barbershop and one had a gun on the other one and he was going to kill him. Like, like, yeah, he was going to kill him. And dad came out. He said, "He said, man, don't do it. You gonna you gonna you gonna waste the rest of your life in jail. You know, talk to him. You know, what I mean, dude, put the gun down. He and the other guy walked away. So that was like, that's godly right there. Yeah. yeah. And for and, him to have that um, bravery to intervene it, in a situation like that." Yeah, he know both parties so good. He know both parties so good. I know both of the parties. You know what I mean? And couldn't believe that it came down to this. Both of the parties knew each other. Yeah. You know? And one of them was ready to kill the other one. I don't know over what had happened, but it was it was going to happen. I had got into a, had a surgery. So just to clarify, you yes. said you had a surgery on your head. Right. Yes. On your brain. There was a there was a, a tumor in my brain. Mm-hmm. Tiny, stay with me at that time for like two months until I got back on on my feet. And um, I happened to look over because I had like such a uh, headache, and I had to look over and I seen Tiny doing insulin. I never knew he was diabetic. I said, "See what you doing." He's like, I'm taking my blood sugar. I said, you, you know, you diabetic? He's like, yeah. I said, oh. So at, at this time, when I'm saying it, for someone that to be to help you, and he's going through. Yeah. You didn't know that he had no. that. Mm-mm. And he was Mm-mm. sitting with you. And um, he did research on it. He called you. He told me. And he brought me there. He brought me there. You know what I mean? And, um, Stay with me. Stay with me. And like I said, I didn't even, at the time I looked at that's when I looked back, probably like three or four days, because I, I had brought this massage here and I just stayed in it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I had, I had to look back when he was doing this insulin or whatever. And I, you know, so I, after that, I stayed on him. It's like we both, you know, looking out for one another. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. True friends. Yeah, yeah. I miss him every day. Yeah, me too. Yeah, he was different. I I want to fight him one more time. You know, just the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> he, he is the town made it true. He is the town made straight up. Jonesy, I say. Jonesy, as hey. soon as I come, hey, I don't want to know. Don't want to know. 
before I could even give him my version of the story. I don't even want to know. Because <laughs> he has he had that discernment, right? Like he already knows the situation what's going yeah, on. Yeah, he already knew. He already knew. <laughs> That's, I mean, that's based on the, the years of psychology and the books that we had to read, leftovers from ego school and by listening and psychologically breaking down things. Tiny knew everything because people came to the barbershop and told him everything. Everything. He do so much stuff where he used to tell me some of the stuff he didn't want to hear. <laughs> People used to tell him stuff. He, he, you know, he didn't want to walk away, but he used to say, "I, you know," he said, "I, I was been trying to get away from him for about fifteen minutes." <laughs> so, He's listening the whole time, sure. but yeah. yeah, I mean, looking at him right in their eyes, but he was dying to get away from. Him. But that's how he was. He wasn't. He wasn't disrespectful. I just want to say, I miss you, Tiny. I thank you for always being there, a listening air for me, because we still have secrets. That nobody knows about what we talk about and i thank you for always um greeting us with smiles and love and i like i told my mom the other day i said anywhere we were going tiny was bringing ice water like pack of hamburgers he was never coming empty-handed <laughs> he was always like they need anything and the last thing i remember honestly for your um wedding reception that you had here he came with all those um, bottles of champagne, and he was and he was sick. He wasn't even like you know he was sick. He had your grandmother that was in a wheelchair, and he just he still he still was doing the normal things that he would do for us, you know. So here we are at the end of the book of Matthew, and over the last few weeks, we've learned so much together. As I said at the top of this episode, and if nothing else is clear. It's very clear that my dad has left a lasting impact on those that he loved the most, but not just them, on the community at large. In the 90s, when he started out, he was one of the few black business owners in Waterbury, and his barbershop was in business for over 30 years. He had given an entire generation of boys, who are now men, their very first haircut. He led a generation of barbers in a unique style of cutting hair. He was a sponsor to many programs around the city. He lended a listening ear when we all needed it the most. They called him a living legend. And now he's passed away, but he's still absolutely a legend in his own right. Now, I do have a story that I want to tell. And it has to do with my dad's favorite musical artist of all time. I'll give you a hint that it's a rapper, but I'm not going to say who it is because there are several people who've talked about this rapper as I've done interview after interview. So I'm going to finish this episode with that artist's song, but we have to start with two short stories. When my dad was in the hospital, we got to the point where we realized that he was going to be going on hospice and that he wasn't going to survive. And we asked him how he would like his funeral to go. We asked him about a pastor. We asked about a place. You know, all of those kind of painful but really necessary questions. And I asked him if there was anything else that he wanted that we hadn't addressed yet. And he kind of smirked. And I knew he was up to no good. And he said, well, if they could have this particular person perform at my funeral, I would be really happy. And that's the artist. And we laughed because this is a famous artist who definitely probably doesn't have time to perform at a random person's funeral. So it was kind of just like a joke. He knew it wasn't going to happen. But my mom and I kind of laugh about it even to this day. So I'm going to stop that story and move on to the next one. And I promise they will connect at the end. As I reached adulthood, I was blessed enough to never have experienced a very close death, if that makes sense. So I had never had a close person die up until I was 25 years old, I think. And at that time, it actually wasn't a person. It was my childhood pet a dog named Snooky. And Snooky was my first dog. Although we had many dogs in our lives, you know, growing up, she was my pet. She was my dog. And she passed away suddenly because she got sick kind of out of nowhere. And when I found out that she had died, I was actually driving on the way to my dad's barbershop. 
Now, I was actually going there to get my hair done by Tyshell, who at that point was working in his shop. And when she came out, she saw my face, saw me crying, and she ran in to tell my dad. He was in the middle of cutting someone's hair, and he could see the look on her face without her even saying what was wrong, and he saw my car out. He stopped the haircut, and he ran out to where I was, and he swung the door open and grabbed me, and he didn't even know what I was crying about, but he just held me, and he hugged me until I stopped crying. And if I'm honest, it didn't take that long, because as soon as I felt his embrace, I felt safe. I felt like I could immediately release the pain, that he was going to take it and do something with it so that I didn't have to feel it anymore. Now, unfortunately, over the course of years after the dog's death, we actually experienced several losses back to back, five losses to be exact. And these losses were people who were my favorite people in the world, my grandmothers, my cousin, an uncle. And my dad was there through all of those deaths. And he experienced it himself because one of those grandmothers was his mother. And through all of that, he was still just as supportive and understanding as he was with that dog. Now, fast forwarding to last year, it was the morning of his funeral and I was six months pregnant. And I remember being alone in the car and riding to the place where we were going to have his repass. I remember thinking he had been there for me for all these other people. Through his own illness, when he knew he was actually dying, he was still a consistent and supportive presence in my life. And at this moment, I realized he wasn't there. I remember thinking, what am I going to do without my dad? And that's when the song came on the radio. And I instantly knew that I wasn't alone. In that moment, he was letting me know that he was right there with me. Because it was a song from his all-time favorite artist. And he loved, like, um, what, like, KRS-One? Um, it'll start off with KRS-One. His favorite rapper was KRS-One. That's the sound of the police. That's the sound of the beast. That's the sound of the police. That's the sound of the beast. And that's a wrap for the book of Matthew. Thanks for checking out the Beauty for Ashes podcast. I'm your host, Destiny Ireland, and I'll see you all in the next one.